Shalom Rastafari. This is a this is a supplement. This is going to be a supplemental to Noah and the Fall. This is a very good PDF that's out there. It's by Jason um, Gwenter. Gwenter, if I'm pronouncing his name correctly, and this particular uh, PDF is some good background um, material based on the Bible and diligent study of the etymology and the meaning of words and, and names that helps us to reconstruct this whole alien and UFOlogy. In fact, the PDF by Jason Gwenther, which we highly recommend, is um, subtitled uh, An Exegetical Analysis on the Correlations between biblical demonology and contemporary ufology or ufology, ufology. Now, this particular uh, document here, let's line this up, this particular document here, and this is the, this is the first uh, page of it. Um, it's, in, it's in color, and it has some very good references like the Schofield Study Bible, biblical references, even some references to the book of Enoch. And this, what's contained in this particular document establishes with proof the whole uh, connection with so-called aliens and UFOs and, and what the Bible mentions as well. And just going through some of the subject matters that are listed, the pre-Adamic time, the time just prior to the flood, and this particular sabbatical portion that we're studying now called uh, Noah or Noch, which is the second uh, Torah portion, is this time just prior to the flood. Then we also have the time period of uh, Jesus Christ's ministry, Jesus Christus, Yeshua HaMoshiach, and then we have the latter days and the tribulation period. Now, um, Jason Gwenther, he establishes some of the basic facts in their biblical context, as well as giving important references, both past and present. And here you see this is a CNN Live a still shot, a developing story concerning uh, NASA or the Nazi Mars discovery. Then we go forward to this picture, picture right here of the um, so-called moon landing, Neil Armstrong in the foreground showing his Masonic um, loyalties. He stated a huge fireball of light hovered over him for some time. This is what was stated. And some of this, if you go and look it up, you'll find that it's there in the report, but most of it is buried, and what comes next is the lie. So he addresses the lie. Um, as well, and then the fallen angels and the whole controversy concerning the the bene or the bene ha Elohim or the sons the sons of God, um, how Christian interpretation has changed over time from the from the Hebraic or the Jewish Old Testament to the early church, what the early church believed, as well as the different books and materials that they consulted as well. Now, here's a quote that actually comes from last week's uh, Torah portion, but it dovetails with this week's Torah portion right here where it says, And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them, that the Baneha Elohim, or the sons of God, saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, to say that they were beautiful, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And this is Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 to 2. Now, um, he also goes into some, some um, good, good uh, reference and understanding about what happened um, in this particular period, and this is the period prior to the flood. He states right here, just to quote briefly, he said, it's not enough that the Bible clearly translates sons of God as angels, but the 
um, propitiators of the real lie will not give you an answer as to why the supposed good sons of Seth would instigate an action which um, denigrates down to nothing more than the rape of woman, it would seem on a mass scale when you study the text. These angels took them wives of all which they chose. He asks, what do you think? There was a marriage and a little white house with picket fence, and they lived happily ever after? Not. What God is what God is saying here is very clear. This union was not amicable or friendly. Also, if the sons of Seth, because some believe that these the sons of God were the Sethites or the children of Seth, or we could say the good suit, and this is also a link with the Egyptian um, mysteries as well. Mm. But be that as it may, he goes on to state here also, if the sons of Seth were so good, why were they not spared the flood instead of Noah's family? The sons of Seth's interpretation would also seem to denote that the daughters of Seth weren't too good-looking. And if they weren't very good-looking, how is it that, they, that there was any sons of Seth question? So he he says, are you getting the drift? He seems to be drifting a little bit here. But then he he brings the point back on track when he says further down here. Um, but what must be understood is that these angels are fallen angels, these so-called sons of God, according to this interpretation. Ancient Hebrew tradition holds that they came down in the days of Jared or Yared, which is similar to the Ethiopic Wered, which means to descend in like Jordan, the Jordan River, Yordanos. Interestingly enough, the word Jared in the Hebrew is Yarad, meaning descend or shall come down from the Strong's reference, 3382. This is why this particular study is good, because you can verify and confirm and meditate and come up with your own um, understanding of the text based on all the evidence that's provided and this is a good study right here so just so you know most of the early church fathers and reputed christian reformers believed in the angelic or the ancient interpretation view and it says well here's a few and he lists some of those early church fathers a very important church father if we will point them out right here is clement of alexandria if you can get any of his works, um, his writings, Clement of Alexandria. And, um, and then they have some modern scholars as well, Bible scholars who support the angel view that, that these sons of God, the Bani Ha Elohim, were angels. Now, he goes, here's where the rubber meets the road, at least for us, is at this particular point where he gives uh, this particular picture that was painted during the Renaissance time and seems to show some men or men men like people in flying vehicles right here. And this is from the so called Renaissance, European Renaissance period of time. But here in the text he says there's further confirmation of the original truth if one wants to go outside of the canon of the Holy Writ the so-called canon of the Bible, the works of the Apocrypha and Pseudopigrapha and the Syriac version of the Old Testament all confirm the Bible's interpretation, including the Dead Sea Scrolls. Most notable is the Pseudopigraphal Book of Enoch, or what we'll state right here. And he doesn't really do it in this, I don't believe so, but it's actually the Ethiopic Book of Enoch which was in the original canon among the works of the Apocrypha. Now, St. Augustine, A.D. 354 to 430, would claim that on account of the book of Enoch being too old, this is St. Augustine, uh, often referenced Roman Catholic um, old church father that they quote, but what he said St. Augustine concerning the, the Ethiopic or the Book of Enoch was that it was too old. Or in the Latin, it was ob, 
uh, nimiam antiquitatum. Therefore, it was too old to say. It was not allowed to be part of the canon of Scripture among the um, European or the Catholic, Roman Catholic Christians. Now, other ap apocryphal works, such as the Book of Jubilees, which is also an Ethiopic, originally discovered Ethiopic book, the Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs, and the Genesis uh, Apocryphon, um, 1947 Dead Sea Scrolls. This is what the Genesis Apocryphon is, the 1947 discovered Dead Sea Scrolls, and the Book of Noah all referred to fallen angels or watches, firing or fathering in that sense, Nephilim or Nephilim with woman. So it was these fallen angels or watches, according to the book of Enoch and the book of Jubilee, who sired or fathered another breed of people who we refer to in our Noah um, portion, the recent Noah portion that we posted online, as these were the hybrids when it talks about Noah or Noah being perfect in his generation. His, gen his seed line was not corrupted with the interbreeding of these um, hybrids. So when it, the Bible speaks about the corruption that was going on of the earth, it's also speaking about the corruption of, of the thoughts of words, as well as of the human seed, humankind, as well as the corruption and pollution of the earth, similar to these present days that we are in presently. So it was the fallen angels of the watches who sired um, the Nephilim with the woman. Now, the Greek word for angels is angelos in the Greek New Testament, but it comes from the word melach in the Hebrew, as well as before that, the Ethiopic, which means messenger. Now, the word watches, according to the Strong's reference 5894, and there's a similar um, reference to this from the Chaldean or the Chaldean is ear, ear, or ear, ear, a watcher. And the ear it probably is a relation to the re or the, the part to see, in the sense, a watcher an angel watcher, but this comes from the primitive root, an uh, older root of or, of or or or, the strong reference right here, the 5782, a primitive root, which means, as we said, it means the opening the eyes, to open the eyes, to awake, and an expanded of this is to lift up, to master, to rise up, or to stir up. There are very interesting adjectives of description indeed. The sudden change from the angel view from the 4th century on was so dramatic. So in the 4th century, Christianity now changed from that fallen angel view to uh, another sort of a view that they was not fallen, these were not fallen angels, that the church that once upheld the angel view would now torture and murder millions of what they called heretics over the next few centuries under the Inquisition, based in part upon this angel heresy. So all those who held that these were fallen angels, many of them became torture and murder victims of the Roman Catholic Church's Inquisition. So how interesting is that? We can speculate on the reasons, the logical reasons behind that. Now, included among the heretics were the so-called um, Yezidis, Yezidis, or the devil worshippers, the so-called Cathars, Arians, the the Bogomil, the Bogomils, and other groups whose so-called heretical theology all instituted to some degree the belief that angels or demons procreated with mankind. So those who understood the old truth, the original truth, that some fallen angels, or we can say in today's so-called extraterrestrials, but more, more than not um, some uh, uh, celestials fell, angels fell, and these were demons 
And this is where we get the nephilim, the nephilim link, the nephilim link. So once one had grasped the profound ramifications of the angel view, then one would not have a problem with what God says in the next couple of verses of Genesis chapter 6. And this is where we're studying presently in our Torah portion reading, the second reading known as Noah or Noch. Yeah, no. If it's not weird enough that fallen angels manifested into flesh before the flood, then you're going to have to contend with the problem of the, quote, offspring, end quote, of this union. Now, something that might not be or seem to be related, but some of you have probably heard of it when they talk about the the crack babies, the crack generation, the crack baby generation that they said this present time is, you know, where the so-called crack babies have grown up in a sense. I think there's some connection with that because all the other signs that we're in those days of Noah are very clear. So some more investigation perhaps on that matter should be conducted as well. But now these were, now here's the next couple of verses, right? Once one grasps the angel view, the old view, the angel view, or the fallen angel view, the demon's view, then one can now grasp what Ha Elohim or Hashem Baruchu says in the next couple of verses, quote, there were Nephilim in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, they bear children to them. The same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. Now, let's just say for the record that the view that Jason Guenta has here is very interesting. He gives a lot of, a lot of uh, um, we can say, facts and evidence pointing to the, the Strong's Concordance and getting into the word roots as well as other documents such as um, the Book of Enoch and the Book of Jubilee, so forth and so on. So he's on to something as far as that part of the, the analytical mind. But there's something wrong with what, what his interpretation is where we disagree. Even though this is a very important document and we might actually post a copy up there so ones can, if they can't find it, it's out there. And he's put it out there for free. So if one can't find it, we'll try to post a, a copy at our website, hopefully shortly as well. But now... When it says there were Nephilim in the earth in those days, and also after that, so there were Nephilim were already in the earth in those days, and also after what? And after there were Nephilim in the earth? So Nephilim came first, and then the sons of God. You see, so what happens a lot, people see Nephilim, people see sons of God, and they compress all of this, but do not properly read the context of the sentences. So the basic facts that he's presenting that are here are correct. Nephilim, fallers, or foolish actors, um, sons of God, Bani Ha Elohim, bearing children, hybrids. The hybrids were already in the earth. The Nephilim were already in the earth, and Nephilim also means to fall. So some say that the angels fell, became Nephilim. And then some say that there were sons of God who bear who bear children, and these were. So there's, there's a couple of different stories that are being flatlined and compressed into the same story. And we're going to present some more evidence to, to prove that contention, but we want this to go on the record right there. But let's just proceed with this part right here. So we have now um, Gwentha going on saying that he wants to make this perfectly clear. The word giants, that's translating your Bible, is a clear-cut interpretation liberty from the Greek. Interpretation liberty? Let's see what he says. He says, the word root was chosen for the translation of the word gi giants on purpose. The root that was used in gigantes or giants, but that's not correct. Yes, they were giant, but that's not what they were. The translators did not interpret from the source root the primitive root of gigantes in the Greek translates gigas, gigas or gigas, meaning earthborn or geo. And we say geo today, but that's part of that same root right there. They 
are also called gibor or giborim, which in the Hebrew, you see your King James Bible is translated from the Greek and Hebrew from cover to cover. Well, that's a little stretch. We hear a lot of these King James only Bible people say this, but actually you find that there's also a lot of Latin as well. So though the Greek and the Hebrew were, were used, Latin also seeps into it. Otherwise, you would not have the word Lucifer. Lucifer is not Hebrew, and Lucifer is not Greek, but Lucifer is Latin, as well as a lot of the names, like Chronicles in the, in the Bible. A lot of these names are basically clearly referenced to the Latin. So they, they tend to overhype it the King James. It's the best of what we have in English or better that we have in English and has been the better ones that we have available in English. But uh, there's a lot of overhype to the King James as well. So let's just make that clear. But in the case of Genesis 6 and 4, the translators specifically chose the Septuagint LXX for the word giants, which was translated from Hebrew to Greek. The reason, question, the source origin Hebrew word is too, he says, quote, unbelievable, even though it is true. It's not believable because they refuted the angel view. So he's saying that the King James translators, having the Hebrew and having the Greek, chose for the Old Testament, chose to go to the Greek and bring in giants, even though the correct word, the Hebrew, was too so-called unbelievable because the correct translation, he goes on to say, in the Hebrew is the Strong's reference 5303, nephil, nephil or nephil, which properly is a fella or a bully or a tyrant or a giant. Its proper use in the plural word for this is nephilim. Giants, though this is the root given, it is not all of the meaning of the word. Now, all of that is correct, but let's just go back here again and read the context of this. There were Nephilim in the earth, or giants in the King James, in the earth in those days. And also after that, also what after, so there was already these Nephilim or giants, or tyrants in the earth. And then after that, the sons of God came into the daughters of men. So I think these sons of God right here, we have to understand the context of it, are being, in a sense, confused with the hybrids that were already in the earth. So the hybrids already, the fallen angels already went into the, to, to the daughters and the women, right? And they already had offspring on the Cain side. And this is the Seth side, but the understanding has been lost, especially among Western, Western Christians. But by doing these sort of studies and presenting some real, critical, some real critical observations, ones might be able to find their analytical way to the truth. But you must trace the roots to find the fruit, is a quote he makes here. And what you come up with is the Strong's reference 5307 Nafal or Nafal a primitive root to fall, be cast down, to cease, a fugitive, to die, to fail, to be judged, thrown down. And also the ancient Chaldean root, Strong's reference 5309, Nephil, Nephil, something fallen, i.e. an abortion, something abortive. Though these are descriptive words for these offspring, the Nephilim, they are much more descriptive of their fathers who bore them. But wait, there were already what in the earth? There were already these Nephilim in the earth, the giants in the earth. And also after that, when the sons of God, you see the Kibbut Neges and the book of Enoch, as well as some of the other Ethiopic um, scrolls explain exactly what a lot of ones are mixing up here. He is trying to attach the sons of God with the Nephilim. The Nephilim, we need to focus on these Nephilim. You understand? So that's, he's saying the descriptive words for the Nephilim offspring. He said the offspring as the Nephilim, quote, end quote. 
So what he's doing is he's reading this, as many do read this in reverse. They read this in reverse where it says, there were Nephilim in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, they bear children to them, which became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. So they're reading this now backwards because they're trying to say, well, the sons of God are these angels that fell, and they had children with the daughters of men, and these men of renown were really flipping around Nephilim. So they're reading this. This verse here, we, we, we listen to a lot of different um, commentators and read their works, and a lot of them seem to follow the same, the same opinion and do not even read this and seek to comprehend it for themselves in the proper order of words. There were already these Nephilim in the earth. It doesn't say how long these Nephilim. Now, when you get to Ethiopic Enoch, it speaks about the fallen watches. It speaks about these fallen watches, but it does not connect these fallen watches, you understand, with these sons of God here. It's, it mentions that the Nephilim were the ones who fell. Previously, they were angels. So ones keep saying that the sons of God are angels, and angels are sons of God. But you remember, and here's the, here's the proof. Let's just knock this one out quickly. Um, look at, uh, what is it? It's uh, Hebrews, where it says, To which of the angels has God said, Thou art my son, this day I have begotten thee. You read it in, I think it's Hebrews chapter 1. It says, To which of the angels has God said, You are my son? You see, and that shuts that down. It doesn't displace the fact that we're Nephilim. Yes, there were fallen angels. But to say that these sons of God, are these is to read this sentence backward instead of if you read it forward it says there were nephilim in the earth in those days then it says what and also after that after that when the sons of god because they were hybrids and there were those who fought against these hybrids this is where like greek mythology and other um, kind of ancient uh, mythologies speak about that there were these beasts and there were these wild creatures. They were part of the hybrids. They were in the earth. And there were ones who became like mighty men or ancient heroes who fought against these wild creatures. But because these creatures, even though they, they, they were the hybrids, they were hybrids, the Nephilim all had offspring that were hybrids who fought against the sons of God, the Nephilim, basically prevail. And when you study mythology, you can see, on, especially like the Greek mythology, you can see where, though they may have fought against these evil beasts, they cut deals and everything like that. So the ones that were not corrupted is that Noah. This is why Noah becomes the one where it says he was perfect in his generation. Anyway, we'll get into that, y'all willing, a little bit more. Let's just get through this right here where it says, um, what seems to give credence to the, quote, rape scenario is the use of the words came in unto in Genesis 6 and 4. It implies that of forcefulness. And also quite interesting is the term, quote, and they bear children to them. See, so he's taking two different parts of that one sentence. This is what many, we don't blame him alone, but many have done this. Just go over this for yourself and, and, and find the truth about this for yourself. Check it out for yourself. It might not seem curious to you at first, but God already stated at the top of the verse that there were Nephilim or giants in the earth in those days. He is emphasizing the fact that there was a definite sexual union between human females and fallen angels, agree, creating a hybrid progeny called the Nephilim, agreed. These are what are referred to in ancient mythology as demigods, half man and half God, or half man and really half demon. They thought of themselves as gods, the fallen angels compared to men. Now, in the Titan, we have is the Greek, the Titan for these demigods, Titan, they have shade on or sate on or suit on, which is curious. And then in the Hebrew, we have Satan and Satan. 
Now, the connection, we find it in the, is it the book of, um, which is the Ethiopic book that speaks about um, when they were, this, it's the book of the Gedla Adam, the Gedla Adam or the, the conflict of Adam. It's an Ethiopic book, and part of it seems to be the base of the lost book of the Bible known as um, the book of Adam and Eve where later on in that document it speaks about how during the time of, of, of Seth and even after that time that his children, they had separated from the children of Cain. But then the children of Cain, they developed like a nightlife and, and parties and clubs and that whole scene. And they dwelt in the valley and the children of Seth dwelt in the mountain. Now you have to remember that the fallen angels already were in the earth you understand, even after Genesis 1. After Genesis 1, the fallen angels were in the earth. Some would imply that they came down in the time of Noah, but that's incorrect. Some would imply that they came down in the time of Yared from our Ethiopic documents. That's not correct. In the time of Yared, Yared was deceived. Yared was almost at that point of being deceived by some of these fallen angel shapeshifters, and that's also in the Gedla Adam, another Ethiopic book. But let's just move a little bit further so we can just dovetail this with what we want to um, uh, bring it forward to. So if most of what you've read and learned about the gods, so-called, of mythology, isn't starting to ring some bells and whistles in your head by now, then you're not alive, says Jason Guenther. It is imperative that you notice that the Nephilim are not the same as fallen angels. Is that what he's saying? Let's read on. You must understand that fallen in the case of these angels is a state rather than a condition at first. What I mean is what happened to the fallen angels after they uh, procreated with the daughters of men. Every indication was seen to say the fallen angels left in the same way they came unto. They materialized out of the flesh and back to their original form, spirit leaving. Well, we don't really agree with this part here. Now, he's trying to explain, and we'll go into more details as necessary um, to explain that that's not, that's not really so that they didn't just like poof into flesh and poof out of the flesh and then had a baby or something like that. No, these fallen angels became like men. You know what I'm saying? They became like giants. They became like gods until they, they were disembodied, in other words, until their flesh is possible for their flesh to die, but being that they are fallen angels, when their flesh, the original host flesh died, this is when they became demons. You understand? He has an interesting interpretation to it as well. But um, we find in Jude 6 and 7, it says, And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. It should be noted here that this is a very unique translation for the word strange here. It is one of 18 different translations and only used in one place one time right here in Jude 7. It is the Strong's reference 2087 to heteros, heteros, heteros. They say I'm uncertain origin. It means other or different, altered, strange when we say heterosexual. So they went to what? Going after hetero or the same flesh. So let's understand this. So what do we see in this time? This is like the days of Noah. And it would seem that Peter affirms this as well, quote, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to Tartarus, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved, to judgment and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, Noah, the eighth person. Saved who? Saved Noah, the eighth person. The link between Noah and the Ankh and the Ogdaod, or the eight in the boat, and we find this in the oldest of the mystery schools or the wisdom schools of Egypt all referring to the new and the boat and the ancestors and the life and the Ankh and Noah. 
This is the, another retelling of Noah we find in ancient in the ancient Egypt. Second Peter two four to five, we have, and as you can see, there seems to be harmony with the Old and New Testaments. As to this strange anomaly, I am bringing to your attention: the angels held in Tartarus are from the days of Noah and shall be released prior to judgment. The angels that sinned are those that copulated with women. These are held along with the Rapha, demons from the Nephilim. Demons not in Tartarus right now on the earth are from the Nephilim after the flood. These are the same demons that Yeshua, Jesus Christus, our black Lord and Savior, contended with in his time or in his demonstration and the ones that are seen today. But right now, I'd like to draw your attention to the flood for a moment. Now, here's where this links with this uh, week's uh, Sabbath portion because this week's Sabbath portion is on the flood. The flood, all right? Now, in The Fallen, Watches, by Jason Guenta, he goes on to write that, to put it in a nutshell, quote, all hell broke loose just before the flood. All hell. This interaction between angels and men created an enormous upheaval. Ha Elohim said all flesh was corrupt. In other words, the DNA the DNA data matrix of humanity was corrupt because there were a lot of foreign bodies and elements within that DNA. And there is a, a holistic relation between creation. So this also, when we look at the corruption that's on earth, like when Christ said, whatever you bind on earth, you bind in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth, you loose in heaven. So this is also what is attracting one can say extraterrestrial or other other beings interest in this particular planet because of the corruption, the out of balance is affecting the entire um, universe. So all flesh was corrupt upon the face of the earth, Genesis 6 and 12. Now this sounds to me like things got way out of hand and this interaction between fallen angel and man had become all encompassing because of the violence the violence as well that was in the earth there were some great wars some even speculate like in some of the alien ancient aliens when you see all these ancient civilizations and they seem like they just got up and left around the same time this is because there was a great there was great warfare you understand and bloodshed between the fallen angels and their and their their um peeps and and mankind and their peeps just before the days of Noah. it's now noah seemed like a crazy person speaking about a flood they never seen a flood they believed that they could not be a flood because they was not paying attention to the signs in their time like this present civilization is not paying too much at least the rulers the tyrants are not paying too much attention to the signs in this time so this um interaction had become all-encompassing like a plague the angels fallen angels had infected the entire human race and don't just think that it was physical just a physical infection, you understand? But psychologically, it's, it's like we keep saying, it's much like these days that we are presently, presently in. That the same sort of fallen angel interaction is happening presently. But more disturbing is that the scripture gives the illusion that this had an impact, not just on man's kingdom or man's dominion, but also on the animal kingdom as well. Now, how do we know this? Well, we, we know this clearly and, 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 and directly from what it says right here. It says that Genesis 6 and 7, and the Lord said, I will destroy man 
whom I've created from the face, this is the key, from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing, and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. It repenteth me that I have made them. God overemphasizes the fact that he had to destroy every living thing off the face of the earth with the exception of Noah or Noah and family and carefully selected animals. This is an extremely stern action that has never really been properly understood as to why. Now you know why. Ha Elohim had to, otherwise no life could have been spared. Left outside the hands of Ha Elohim, man and beast would have been utterly annihilated by the Nephilim infestation. And he doesn't mention this here, but what this would have created if that breakdown of, of the, the law that that inversion of the law, that this polarity had happened, this would have turned into something similar to a black hole. And it would also have destabilized the entire universe as well. So what happens here also affects what goes on elsewhere. So think about that. Think about what's going on on Earth. And then they're talking about all this alien and extraterrestrial activity. And they're not viewing it. This is the key, too. They're not viewing the so-called alien, even though they're looking for aliens, they are afraid of aliens. But the only ones that ascend to heaven is not dead people after they die. That's a, that's a Christian lie, actually. But as Christ says, is the one who descended from heaven. Only he ascends. So if we look at Jesus Christ properly, he is an extraterrestrial or a celestial. And he said he had others that he must minister to. So then think about it. The people or the tyrants that are ruling are afraid of the so-called aliens and are building weapons of mass destruction and space-based weapons not to welcome these aliens. So it clearly means that they understand that these aliens are not the evil monsters. You see, because really the ones who are fallen and trapped down here are the same Nephilim infestation and their offspring and those who think on their same mental wavelength. Those who think on their same mental wavelength are theirs as well. Now you know why God had to, otherwise no life could be spared, left outside the hands of Ha Elohim. Man and beast would have been utterly annihilated by Nephilim infestation or by themselves. This interaction also seemed to instill irrevocable destruction to the spirit nature, the spirit nature of humanity, as it says in Genesis 6 and 5, and here's the key, that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Look around, look around. The imagination of the thoughts of humanity's heart is also coming to this very same sort of level. One of the signs is the earthquakes, is the floods. Not a universal global flood, but as Elohim said in Torah, he said that he won't flood the entire earth, but he, he did not say he would not use water. And there's a very important spiritual reason to the use of water and the floods that are going on here and there presently, you'll find that there's the same sort of infestation and interaction in these, in these regions and zones as well, which is like a cancer in that sense um, on God's earth. So there was only one way for Ha Elohim to handle this, this dilemma, by, quote, wiping the proverbial slate clean. This is like where Revelation talks about new heaven and a new earth. This is what we're on the cusp and the border of. And that's exactly why Adonai, or the Lord, did the flood. ha Satan or Shaitan, Sut'an, had attempted to infiltrate all flesh literally. And not just the flesh, but also to affect 
to take over the Trinity, take over man's spirit, soul, and body, to try and thwart the inevitable birth of the Moshiach, the, the Christ, as we know, Yeshua, HaMoshiach, our black Lord and Savior. Now, had Ha Elohim not, not taken that stern action of the flood, the doom of all humanity would have been a surety, the plague of fallen angels completely and utterly perverted all flesh. In other words, it perverted the DNA, God's DNA matrix within humanity, even down to the animal kingdom, as Elohim destroyed them as well. In other words, he really put them out of their misery because they were not able to do it. They had fallen to such an extent that they were not able to do it themselves. I mean, look at this present time. We all know the system is broken. We all see what's going on. But it's like humanity is so um, disempowered spiritually, they're not able to, to make that change. Only whine about it or opine about it. But Elohim, Ha Elohim, our Father and the Moshiach has a solution. We may never know the full extent of the ramifications dealing with the flood event, but we do have somewhat of a picture if we believe or accept the truth of the Bible. Like most of the deeper truths in the Bible, they are not shown openly on the outside, but rather somewhat mixed throughout the Scripture. These truths are only discernible when one digs deep into all the word and pulls these points together. There are things written in the Bible that no one has found as yet, as things have not occurred for the prophecy given to be revealed. Ha Elohim made his word this way. Some things must come to pass for these truths to come to the forefront or to the frontal lobe, the consciousness of people, for them to see it. As he says, in the latter days, you will understand or comprehend this perfectly. And so it is with the area of the Nephilim in the Bible. It has been the modern UFO era that has brought to light the truths revealed in Genesis chapter 6 and also confirming what Christ had said about the time of the end. And it's similarly to the time of the flood. As a matter of fact, the Bible says the end will be exactly, exactly like the time before the flood. Though Satan, Yitarragama Yehun, failed the first time, he will and is attempting it once again, for his time is short. The reality of this truth is and will be totally denied by the so-called uh, church or so-called Christians at large, for it goes against their uh, doctrines as taught by men. It, is, it, it does not matter, for the truth will always remain the truth, no matter how much they try to deny it. Now, Noah and the seven others of his family were speared. What the church will teach you is that Noah was perfect. He was a just man, and thereby he was superiorly righteous before the Lord. Nope, you have to dig deeper than that. The word perfect here is translated in the Hebrew from the Strong's reference 8549, uh, tamim or tamim, entire, me, without blemish, complete, perfect, undefiled, whole. Remember when we was in the Mark section, we said um, that Bamarinya is a fitum, fitum, the tum, the tum. Amim, the same root right there. It means complete, or in ancient Egypt, the tomb, the pi tomb. It comes from an even earlier root, tamam, to be clean or consumed, to make an end. That means be perfect. In other words, complete in the sense of completion. Uh, Strong's reference 8552. Now, all these adjectives are descriptors 
of sacrifices and used in this context. Certain sacrifices or burnt offerings had to be made with animals that were unblemished or perfect specimens physically. These were considered undefiled and acceptable offerings to Adonai. Face it, folks, we found out after the flood that Noah wasn't at all that perfect in the false sense of perfect. Now, was he? He uh, well, uh, Gunther says he was a drunk. Uh, we will say he had gotten drunk in. After experience like that, wouldn't you drink a little bit? No. I'm pretty sure the Word of God is indicating that Noah's bloodline was undefiled by the fallen angel and the hybrid invasion. His genealogy was unaffected by the fallen ones, thereby allowing an untainted bloodline in other words, the melanin, his melanin, in other words, we can say, was intact to pass through the flood, which passes on through to the first event of the Savior. Both the spiritual and physical aspects of pureness or perfection, unblemished without spot, are represented in the scripture. What has never been properly explained is the physical aspect. The interpretation by the church of today, the so-called Christian Sodonimos Christian church, it leaves God looking like a bumbling idiot when it comes to his creation. No, there is something deeper inferred by God in the laws of cleansiness and purification as to what is interpreted commonly today. God does not put just any old thing in his word and expect you to uphold them. No, there is precise meaning and purpose in every last jot and tittle of his word. The whole mystery of why the flood becomes clear when one acknowledges the truth of Genesis chapter 6. You will begin to understand why the person of Noah and his purpose according to the flood event. You will understand why Noah was spotless, considered spotless and righteous without blemish. This will not seem at all too remarkable when one looks at the uh, to topology and eschatology concerning Noah in comparison with Christos or the Christ. There is a hidden message in the genealogy from Adam to Noah. It is quite remarkable in that it really sums up to be a prophecy concerning our black Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in the most simplest of ways you can think of. If we take the names of Adam's descendants up to Noah and translate them from Hebrew to English, we find this remarkable message of Jesus Christos' mission for the redemption of all mankind from the curse exacted at the fall. And we'll leave you with this right here where the Hebrews column is here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So there's ten, right? And now Adam, man, Seth, appointed, Enosh, mortal, Canaan, sorrow, Mahalalel, the blessed God, Jared, shall come down, Enoch, teaching, Methuselah, his death shall bring, Lamech, the despairing, Noah, rest or comfort. So that's very interesting there and something to, to meditate on. So look for this particular document. This is just a couple of pages. We're up to page 11, but there's more interesting pages as well that links with this whole um, uh, fallen angels, fallen watchers, genealogy, so forth, and so on. So look forward to it. Look for it. It's out there. It's called the Fallen Watchers, and it's a good supplement, especially to this area of our uh, Torah sabbatical studies, our Rastafari Sabbath studies concerning um, Genesis, especially Genesis chapter six. So stay tuned and um Rastafari Shalom. This is Wendem Yadin.